be very, very welcoming everyone. We are live and we have Andrew with us. I'm going to be seeing just for a little bit how many people we have live so that I know that I'm not talking to myself uh, and to Andrew. So we're going to wait for that uh, a little bit, but we are at the top of the hour and ready to start the broadcast. And I see people coming. So whoever is coming, please do comment wherever you are. You can be on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Facebook, um, or I don't know where else I am streaming this, but these three platforms for sure. So go ahead, uh, say hi and say, where are you dialing in from? And we're going to start with you, Andrew. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, a little bit uh, about your background before we dive into the suite of tools that we have, that you sure. have, that you created. Sure. Well, me and my team, I don't want to take all the, the credit yes. for it. A lot of, a lot There's of always a team involved. And it's a, yes, it's a sure. um, let's say it's a, a thought shortcut that uh, this is just you. There's not, all, and I saw your presentation and there are acknowledgements uh, at the end for everyone. And just for the sake of clarity, Andrew's tools means Andrews and his team. Yes. Okay. That's that. I'll accept. I'll accept that abbreviation for the uh, rest of the chat. Um, so my name is Andrew Janowick. I'm an assistant professor at Emory University. I also work at the University Hospital of Geneva and Lausanne in Switzerland, and I'm the secretary of the Swiss Digital Pathology Consortium, uh, where we have a group of about 150 people that are interested in digital pathology. Uh, if you're based in Switzerland, feel free to reach out to me for that about membership. My specialization is in computational pathology, uh, in particular using machine and deep learning algorithms to analyze bright field images and trying to identify image-based biomarkers for things like diagnostics, prognostics, and therapy response prediction. Mm -hmm. And you are physically in Geneva, but you're also affiliated with another uh, entity. Tell us about that a little bit. With the university. Yeah, with the Emory University. Yeah, so I, I'm an assistant professor at Emory University, and we have some students there that help build out these tools. And in fact, the tools that you see here are supported by NIH grants. So on the acknowledgments page, there's the NIH uh, helping us to develop these tools and make them free and publicly available for people to use. Uh, I think part of this web series is, uh, in fact, to help that discussion and help that visibility, to help disseminate the tools and let people know what's available to them, uh, to provide some support for those but as well to gather ideas and feedback from, from the users and from people in the community to see what types of things they would need in order for it to be more useful or other directions that could be taken. Uh, and as well, they're all open source, right? So we're, we'll go through the, the four tools over the next three sessions. Um, they're all open source. So if there's people that are interested in coding or improving or in adding their own ideas to it, uh, we're certainly happy to receive those contributions. If you have bugs, you can uh, also put them there. If you have bugs, don't contact us. Don't, yeah, yeah. That's sorry about that. <laughs> bugs, uh, don't don't tell me the bugs. But if you I have, uh, you know, pull pull requests, uh, you know, if you have feature requests like these sort of things, uh, you know, I'm I'm happy to take it. Just kidding. Here, software is gonna have bugs regardless what my kind software, of software doesn't have any bugs. <laughs> Except for Andrew's software. Yeah, only mine. But my team, me and my team. Yes. Yours <laughs> and your teams. And uh, just a, a couple of logistics. So in wherever you are. Um, viewing this, you can uh, put comments in and I can uh, show those comments and uh, you will see your name and you will see your questions. Uh, there are going to be uh, places during this presentation where I'm going to be asking questions and I'm going to be asking you to ask questions. Uh, so go ahead then in the chat and um, Andrew in a second, I'm going to ask you to start presenting. But uh, for now, from those who are live already, let me know if you are using any of those tools. Uh, and the first one I uh, learned about was HistoQC. And then at some point I saw your LinkedIn post and there was patch sorter, cohort finder and histoblur and something. I'm like, if I don't know, people don't know. We have to talk about it. So let's talk about it. Let's do it. Ready to go? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have it. Uh, this is basically my, my overall outline. And, and I think maybe we could keep this like fairly informal. So if you have questions, we can do some questions. And if people have questions, we can we can answer them live. Right. I, I prefer to not mm -hmm. do yeah, all the talking. Totally. And that's, that's the setup. Mm -hmm. Make it more interesting for other folks. So... I've been in this business for a while, and 
essentially people think that it works like this. We scan some slides, we do some magic, and then there's a biomarker of interest or there's a prognostic predictor or diagnostic predictor, whatever it is, right? And then you, you, you the first time you do this project, it, it feels like magic. And then you do the project again and again and again. And then you start to realize that in fact, this magic box is broken into two components. You have pre-analytical components and then you have post-analytical components. I would call post-analytical things that are specific to your use case, right? So you want to go and identify how many lymphocytes are next to tumor cells within a tumor boundary, right? These are post-analytical. These are things that only you really need for your specific use case. And then uh, we're not going to talk about any of those today. We're only going to talk about pre-analytics. Pre-analytics are things that everyone has to do for all of these biomarker and diagnostic projects. So these pre-analytics, uh, it contains things like quality control. And one of the things we'll discuss today is an open source tool called HistoQC that will help provide that quality control at scale. We have another webinar, I think next week, where we'll discuss quick annotator. Uh, and this shows how we can rapidly annotate objects. We have a seminar after that the, the following week for a patch sorter, which will show us how we can um, use machine and deep learning algorithms to have high throughput object labeling. And what's interesting about those two middle tools is that they're they have deep learning backends, which makes them very agnostic to different stain types, different image modalities. Uh, you can use bright field, you can use fluorescence. You, you have a lot more freedom there, any types of organs, right? It's really becomes very user driven based off of how the user's using that particular tool. And then the last step of these pre-analytics is we really wanna go and find um, good quality training sets and good quality validation sets and kind of good quality testing sets but as well, maybe we want to go and figure out how we can optimally spend our time to have a very heterogeneous data set or a re well representative data set and cohort finder will help you do that. So that's the second tool that we'll discuss today. So okay. question already for me, I'm going to be raising my <laughs> yeah, hand to ask questions. On. So, and um, I like that. That's actually very helpful. <laughs> Then I don't interrupt you. But um, so the question is, you build all those tools because they have um, not doing what these tools help you to do can have or has a huge impact on what you're providing as results from your uh, image analysis experiments, sure. image analysis yes. projects. Mm -hmm. What yes. magnitude of uh, impact can not thinking about those things, be it with the use of your tools or without, have on the output and on the publications that are currently out there and on, you know, in general, on research and making conclusions out of image analysis projects? That is a fantastic question that I genuinely do not think we answer enough. We don't ask it enough. And we certainly don't answer it enough. I would say, and, and I actually have a slide in this presentation about what happens uh, as a result of unreproducible histo uh, uh, quality control. And you can see 30% difference in just the beginning data before even running a study. So if you have, you know, I don't want to give away too much and leave some magic for the slide, but if you have a cohort of slides and you ask different people to select good quality slides to run an experiment on or to run a biomarker discovery on, our results show that there's only about a 75 percent concordance with that, which means that 25 to 30 percent of the patients are different between these these groups. So you can have three and we had experts, three different experts sit down, curate cohorts from the same set of available patients. And each of them would have started an experiment with different data. Now, this mm -hmm. is even before you go and come up with a hypothesis. This is even before you uh, like do all of the experimental specific things. This is the pre, 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 the slides have just been scanned. Now you're picking the quality of which ones are, are good quality. And at that stage, everything after that you can imagine now is only going to have widening error bars associated. Mm -hmm. with it. So it's hard to precisely quantify what exactly the penalty is, but we're starting to see more and more and more that it's more substantial than we previously thought it was. Okay. Okay. Yes. So we have the, we've generated what we call the histo tool suite, which is, consists of these four tools. They're basically an open source pre-analytical pipeline. Uh, we've tried to design them very well in the sense that they should be able to fit into each other. So today we'll discuss histo QC and cohort finder. Cohort finder actually begins by consuming the output from histo QC. So if you run histo QC, you can now run cohort finder, it takes about a minute. So you can run cohort finder in a minute and receive all the added benefits with basically no additional work. So we'll start with histo QC. 
Do your You're using, knee. Are the fingers the relative importance of the question? Yeah. Like the no, first no. one was five and this one was just two. I just trying to try, try to gauge what. <laughs> no, no, just a uh, question. It's like the big time raising, <laughs> raising hand is question. So question, yes. do you need to um, use all of them or can you pick and choose? For sure, you can pick and choose. For sure, you can pick. I, I think the only requirement is, is that if you use Cohort Finder, you have to use something like HistoQC first. Mm -hmm. There's probably a number of different ways that you can do that, but I don't currently know of any other tools that will provide you the right information for Cohort Finder to be maximally usable. But the other, HistoQC, Patch Sorter, and Quick Annotator can each be used uh, independently, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. So we can talk about some reproducible quality control. Um, we discovered at the beginning of, of building this tool out that there was really an unmet need for quality control. So these are example slides from the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is a breast cancer cohort. Um, and I'm arguing that as we transition to digital workflows, digital quality control is gonna become paramount. So we can start to see some, some issues here already, right? We can see like this, we cracks in the cover slip. We can see an air bubble under the slides. These have kind of like some pen markings because it was a research cohort. We see some knife chatter, we see some tissue folding, and this one's really heavily destroyed by a, a large air bubble underneath that uh, cover slip there. Ideally, we'd like to be able to identify these poor quality slides immediately and recut and rescan them as needed before they get into the workflow, right? So you don't want a pathologist to sit down to their desk and say, oh, I have an hour to do my work. And then the first thing they do is they pull up a bunch of blurry slides and say, actually, I can't make a diagnosis on this send them back to the lab. Now someone in the lab has to go and refine that maybe if it's not a scanning issue, they have to refine the tissue block, which may now be further away, or they have to refine the slide, which may now be displaced. It's a lot better if we can identify it immediately while the slide is still in the scanner and say, oh, by the way, slide number 78 is blurry, rescan it, right? And, and you can start to imagine how that's going to improve everyone's life downstream. As well from a research, what's say, as well from a research perspective, we don't want to store this stuff. Right? Because if you have garbage slides and you upload them to a large repository or to your on-site clinical repository, you're paying per byte. Really, you're, you're actually paying per byte. Right, Hard drives get full. Now, if you know that 5 or 10% of those slides are completely useless just because of poor quality and they're not usable in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to argue that you can save 10% on your infrastructure costs just by not saving garbage. Right, so there's kind of like a very organic kind of making sense uh, point there. You wanted to ask a so, question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said, and you can let me ask the question whenever you're done with your thought. That's perfectly fine. Uh, you Hit said um, you can do them, you can use them while the slides are in the scanner. Sure. Are you going to talk about that, or shall we talk about that now? I want to know we, we how this happens. Now. Because yeah, we, what, we can talk about it. what the non-computer um, scientist users are used to is like, okay, first is the scanning, you have the scans, then you run some kind of algorithm, then you see something, mm -hmm. you go back. How can your tools be in the scanner? Well, they're not in the scanner, right? So as the slides are being scanned, the, the scan is being streamed to the information management system where it becomes available. Once it's available, we can already start running algorithms on it. So if you have a large clinical scanner that has room for, let's say, a thousand slides, by the time you get to the end of the slide, uh, the last thousandth slide, the first slide is already available in the information management system. You can already run an algorithm on it, and you can already say this is good or bad quality. So it's not that the image itself, it's not that the algorithm runs inside of the scanner, but you can connect As it into that workflow. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, if the scanning was instantaneous and the slide immediately somehow disappeared out of the scanner, this wouldn't work but it takes time to scan each of those slides. So as a, as a consequence of that, there is a, a really nice opportunity there to stick a bunch of quality control algorithms in to say, in hey, parallel. by the way, slide 57, yeah, yeah, slide mm -hmm. number 57 was blurry. Even though I know you're scanning slide 150, I just finished processing slide number 60 and it's uh, there's, there's a cracked cover slip or something. You might want to check that, right? So there's mm -hmm. kind of an opportunity there. So do you see the questions that I'm pulling out uh, on the screen? Uh, yes. How does the image so, quality change if I do HistoQC and let's say analyze in another IA software? How does, it, does, does the, the image, image quality change? Does it change? It doesn't change, right? So HistoQC does not change any image qualities. HistoQC only measures image qualities. And then it becomes up to the user to decide if and how they want to go and use that information to, to trigger some type of a process. Okay. Thanks for the question.
Yeah, I'm gonna, whoever wants to ask questions, I have those all visible in the comments and I'm gonna be pulling them and Andrew will be able to answer real time. Let's do it. So hopefully now I've convinced you that there's some cost and efficiency savings by just analyzing or, or finding poor quality slots. And if we can find them, you know, we can save pathologist time, we can save technician time, we can reduce overhead costs. Now, previously this wasn't insurmountable. So for example, when I was doing my PhD, we had cohorts of maybe 20 slides. So you'd spend an afternoon, you'd look at each that of the slides. That was a long oh, time ago, right? Long time ago. Be like, this, this region is blurry. You know, let's not use this region. This is good tissue. This is adipose. I'm not interested in it, whatever it is. And you would just manually go and annotate that, right? But now it's, it's clear that this is really just too time consuming to do manually. There's hospitals that are generating 4,000 slides a day. And you really can't go and think about spending five minutes per slide just to analyze it for quality control. You've now defeated the, the entire purpose of that kind of high throughput process of, of generating digital images. And then most importantly, at me from a scientific standpoint, and this, we, we kind of touched on this earlier, is that if I have to make a decision unaided about what is good or bad quality, it essentially makes it non-reproducible. Now there's a human bias factor, right? So I can go and look at something, say, oh, maybe this is good today. And maybe the next day I'll be a little bit more pessimistic and say, oh, I didn't really really work yesterday. Now I have kind of some type of, of fluctuation. So as a scientist, we want to try and hold as many variables constant as possible. So if we have deterministic measurements, we can leverage those measurements to be as to, to really reduce the variance in, in how we perceive quality over time. So a fair question would say, I pulled out the TCGA and you can say, well, is that for only the TCGA? So we conducted a similar study with the uh, Neptune Consortium. This is a large uh, multi-site, there's 38 contributing sites consortium that we're involved in in the kidney disease domain. And it turns out they have similar problems. It's really any large scale digital pathology repository that I've seen in my life has this issue, right? All clinical laboratories that I know have some type of a quality control issue. Maybe it's not a big issue, but I, I mean this in the sense that no one's producing 100% perfect slides all the time, right? And, and there's a good reason for this. It's because it's not like, you know, manufacturing a, a, a metal component for a car where you have something that you can go and have down to atomic precision, right? Building a slide is still a manual human process. We still go and physically put things in fixative. We physically cut the tissue. We put it on the slide, well, you know, using our fingers or using tweezers, right? There's, there's components here that have some human, some biological, some environmental variability. So as a result of that, there are just by design, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It, we just have to detect these anomalies that kind of stick out from the standards that we're aiming for. So in the end, what is HistoQC? It's an open source reproducible quality control toolbox. Uh, it has a Python backend. I'll kind of briefly discuss that. It's not too interesting uh, there, um, but it, it will produce a mask of uh, that indicates where on the slide there's good quality tissue and it'll produce actionable quality control scores and metrics. And we'll discuss more of those. There's also what I think is probably the most important part here which is an HTML5 front end for actually visualizing and investigating the results at a cohort level. And, and this is really where I think this, this particular tool shines. Of course, you need the back end to compute the metrics so you can see them in the front end, but the back end going and producing an Excel spreadsheet that you have to look at, you know, your eyes will start to water over at some point. You really want some type of visual feedback that makes the quality control process a little bit sexier. And I think that's really what that, that front end provides. High five. Yes. Oh. So you say, <laughs> high five. you say yeah. back end, front end, yeah. but yeah. this is not a fully packaged tool with a user interface, correct? So I would consider the front end the user, the user, the interface. user interface. How? Yeah. Um, and then we have two questions for the audience. Sure. But how? Where would you position it um, in the whole spectrum of like fully user friendly for lay people to mm -hmm. uh, on coders only that actually know Python? Where does it fit into the spectrum? So that's a great question. The way that we've, I would say, well, it's it's also interesting because you can break them up into these two components. So for the Python backend, I would say you would want a modest level, not expert by any means because all of the programming is done, but at least setting up the environment and actually executing the command for the first time, you probably want someone with, we'll say, intermediate level Python capabilities. And then okay. once it's set up, in fact, then it, then it, a lay person can use it, right? Then a lay person just has to go and double, double click on it. And just as long as the slides are in the same directory, HistoQC will run as normal. 
The front end itself, I would say any, anyone can use it. In fact, we have pathologists that have no programming ability whatsoever, very happily interact with the user interface and it's still very meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, quick question. Uh, what um, formats? Do we have, uh, do you have um, Great. Yeah. So HistoQC uses OpenSlide as its um, whole slide image reader. So it supports MRSX, it supports SVS, supports NDPI. Um, you know, I think there's probably 10, 10 of them that are the most famous, most legacy kind of ones. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't support, for example, the Philips iSyntax format. So that's a entire other, other beast. Um, I think we're working on a version um, that maybe will support DICOM. We don't know how much interest there is in the, the community for that, uh, but that's something that we can look into. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I think most importantly, and, and this kind of like ties into this idea of cohort finder that we'll discuss later, is that HistoQC can aid in the detection of batch effects. We'll explain what batch effects are and how we can detect them and why that's important in the uh, second half of this presentation. HistoQC is available at histoqc.com. Made it very easy, right? So if you already know the name of the tool, you can find it. I remember that. Trivially. Uh, so some of the properties of it, histoQC runs very, very quickly uh, in the sense that it's, it was able to process, this was five years ago, I think now, 1,100 images using a six-core machine in about 24 seconds. So we've really tried to build this in a way that you can use it for um, high throughput scanning. You know, it's, it's not something where it can take 45 minutes, but it takes your scanner one minute to scan the image, right? So I think it's a very reasonable amount of time given um, the, the scanning time that's associated with this. Uh, it's very easy to install. Um, so as I mentioned, it's, it uses very standard Python libraries. There's really nothing uh, extremely bizarre here. If, if you've done any computational pathology, it's very likely that you know 100% of these libraries. So I, I, we did this intentionally. Uh, we've made some decisions that made our, our lives harder as developers, but we made those decisions to really keep the amount of additional knowledge or experience that someone needs as low as possible so that they can get up to speed with this if they're interested. And as a result, we have some first year, second year undergraduate students, and even some later year high school students that are able to go and write code and contribute to HistoQC over time. The user interface is a single local HTML file, so there's no hosting needed. You don't need to set up a web server. Uh, there's no deep learning here, so you don't need any specialized hardware. In fact, the results that you see at the top here were generated using my laptop. So it's just really standard commercial grade laptop and it, it worked quite well. There's also no internet connection required. So as a result, I would argue that it's suitable for hospitals with private data. You can use it with non-anonymized data, with PHI, with patient names on the labels. All of that's fine because you, it'll operate within your firewall restrictions on a server that you set up and just kind of stick in the, stick in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I mentioned, it's designed really to be very modular and easily extensible. This is really to help motivate the community. Some of our students work on it uh, with this idea of becoming a central hub of QC so that as new algorithms or new metrics or new concepts are developed, we provide boilerplate code. So it's very easy to add that. So I think Histo QC maybe detects, I think maybe 50 different features now, and maybe your specific use case is really interested in the amount of red in the upper left-hand corner of a slide. It's, it's maybe five lines of code to add that, right? We've really designed this in a way that you can take that boilerplate stuff, you get an image, write whatever you want to analyze that image, and then saving it is equally trivial in, in one line of code. So question for me, and then a couple of yes. questions here. A question for me. I don't code, don't have any ambition to code ever. I That's, take That makes this... me sad. <laughs> You're missing an opportunity. <laughs> See, maybe I am. Uh, maybe you know, I I'm guess we need people to host this, though, right? So, yeah. Right. But so, but I want this. I want this HistoQC. So I yeah. take this. Uh, I go to histoqc.com. And who yeah. do I go to in my institution? To IT? I or... would go to the IT department. Yeah, sure. So yeah. the same people that have set up that scanner and set up the, mm -hmm. the, that, mm -hmm. the connection between the scanner and the information management system, 100% confident they'll, they'll know how to do this. Okay, good. So basically, everybody who uh, everybody who works with my digital pathology infrastructure, they will yeah. be able yeah. to use it. Okay. And yeah. I, questions... I would argue if there's someone that knows how to use that scanner or knows how to set up that scanner, then there's someone that 
has he knows how to do very it. much the skills needed to to also put this into use. Mm -hmm. We have one question: Can HistoQC yes. be used for individual TMA core assessment? Interesting individual TMA core assessment. I would no, no, right? Because right? It, it's would, it would work slide. on the whole slide as a single slide. Mm -hmm. But that's interesting because. Well, that's yeah, I've never thought about that. See, you know, I, I think it's actually uh, pretty easy to add that in. See, hmm, that's interesting. Then what the answer is, is no, but I'm interested. I'm interested. The next question: What is the magnification in which these images uh, patches were analyzed? That's a great question. So I think a lot of this will depend on your specific use cases. For a lot of the so you can set that up. The user can specify it. So in each of the different modules, and we'll see an example of this, you can say, I want this process like blur detection to take place at 20x. I want this other thing to take place at 1.5x. And you can make like fake magnifications and it'll automatically go and take the next largest one and rescale it to that particular size. So if you don't have a 2.5x stored, but you have a 5x stored, it'll convert it to a 2.5x because that's what you requested and then run that, that analysis. What's interesting is that it, I, I think it provides a lot of usability. You know, if we're going to be frank about this, if you want to go and do blurriness detection, you can identify blurry regions at a low magnification in a lot of cases if there's stuff there that you can see is blurry. So if you have like a lot of cells or a lot of epithelial regions, there's a lot more edges. It's easier to identify blurry regions because you don't see those edges and you can get away with a 2.5x magnification, which is going to be pretty quick, right? You're going to be able to mm -hmm. de blur detect in a few seconds. On the other hand, if you don't have a lot of epithelial cells and you have something that's pure stroma or you have something that's pure necrosis where it's very, very, very smooth, and that's really your specific use case, you can't reasonably expect to detect that blurriness at 2.5x because the blurry one and the non-blurry one look exactly the same at that magnification. You can go then and say, I want this process to take place at 10x, 20x, you know, maybe you run an experiment or two to figure out what's reasonable for your for your use case in your particular slides, but there is going to be a time consequence for that. So you can imagine if, if something's five seconds, this, this is math, we're, we're doing this on the spot here. If it takes five seconds at 2x magnification and you need to now do it at 20x magnification, it's actually going to take you 16 times longer because you mm -hmm. pay for that both in the consequence in the x and the, the okay. y dimension. So it's a squared additional time plus. So question, quick question, HistoQC interact, does HistoQC interact with QPath? And we kind of started talking with before going live. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? And yeah, that's interesting. Move on um, the presentation. You know, I know, I know Pete Bank, had, uh, you know, pretty well, you know, I, I'd like to think of him as a friend. I don't know if he thinks of me as a friend, but Pete, if you think I'm a friend, send me a, send me a message. Um, you know, we haven't really spoke about it. I don't, I don't know. Would there be an interaction? Yeah. What um, there? I'm not. I would have to think about what the, you know, maybe maybe if the person uh, has an idea as to what the value would be, I would I would like to know that better. Okay, so because uh, in theory, the way that I because I use QPath all the time, right? So it's not like I'm against the idea. I love QPath. The idea is that you would we typically go and do the quality control using HistoQC first, using... yeah, remove the slides. And then now we have a scientific cohort, then we will go and start using image viewers, for example, QPath, to go and actually mm -hmm. do the analyses and the, those sort of downstream things. So we mm -hmm. kind of have broken the connectivity between those tools, because I, I guess I view them as different processes, but I don't, I don't know if there's a use case to, to merge them together. It's something interesting to think about. I don't think about the use. I don't know what the use case you, uh, could be, but Faye, if you have a specific use case, let us know. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Um, so who are the end users of HistoQC? I would argue one of them are pathology departments. You can get real-time rolling average metrics, right? So you can identify issues early. If you're going and making 30,000 slides a month, you want to find out that something's wrong with your hemotoxylin slide as, as stain as soon as possible. Right. So with a HistoQC approach, as soon as the first slide is made poorly, that's outside of the bounds that you set. I can imagine a use case. We don't provide this this process, but we can discuss it if someone's interested, where the uh, lab manager gets the text on their phone and says, like, hey, the last five slides were outside of the bounds that you set. You know, maybe you want to go take a look and see if something's wrong or something needs to be adjusted. Right. So 
it's it's not HistoQC that provides that functionality in the sense of sending that text message, but it provides the opportunity for it because it will produce those metrics. So once you have those metrics and once you know what your standards are, now that allows you the opportunity to go and do all of these, these other things that you don't have if you're not taking measurements. Mm-hmm. For the repositories and computational folks like myself, we basically want to avoid saving garbage data. We also want to avoid analyzing uh, bad quality slides and we want to be able to identify outliers. So we have tons of weird things, like we see large stain variances, and maybe some stain variances are are not appropriate. These are both from the same cohort, but they were probably scanned on different days or stained on different days. Um, We see microns per pixel heterogeneity. This is from the TCGA cohort as well. I think this is fascinating, and and very few people think about this, but microns per pixel is the measurement of how much real-world physical space is associated with a pixel. And if you think about what that means, that means in these images here that are different microns per pixel, it means one image, this, this, a pixel is corresponds to a different size in the real world than a, an image from an, a, a different image. I explained that very poorly. But essentially, you can go and say this, how, how is this that cell is 10 pixels resolution? big. Mm-hmm. You, yeah, exactly. You could say this pixel, this cell nucleus is 10 pixels big. And according to these results here, in the real world, that can be up to a 10, 15% difference. Mm-hmm just because of this inherent variability. So if you're building algorithms that, for example, take cell size into account, you probably want to know if you have comparable microns per pixel across your entire cohort, especially if you're going intracyte. And we'll see how HistoQC makes it very, very obvious. Um, we also see difference in base magnification. So not all slides are going to be scanned at 40x. Some of them are only scanned at 20x. If you're running a scientific experiment across 10,000 slides, you probably want to know that and identify the ones that are at 20x because you probably want to write different code for them or analyze them separately or somehow treat them differently. But the idea is that you should be aware of this type of stuff and and it'd be nice to do that in an organic, easy way. So I promised an introduction to the back end. This is what a pipeline looks like. This is pretty standard Python code where we have a bunch of different modules and each of the modules does something. One of them that we're going to discuss here is compared to templates. uh, And it's just a list. We provide this list. There's, I think, maybe five or six different configuration files that are already available for H&E, PAS, Silverstein, Trichrome, IHC. I don't know. Maybe like, oh, we have a fast one that's really good for clinical usage because it really just looks at the most important stuff. And then we have another one that I think is more research grade, which takes, I think, maybe four or five times longer, but really does a very, very deep dive on the slide to look for absolutely everything. So now yes. that you're mentioning this, I have a question here. What about IF? Not IF, right? This is Brightfield. It yeah, can the be there, somehow there's... adapted for IF. The, the challenge is that the, I don't know of any IF image formats that are readable by OpenSlide. So it's not really a... HistoQC okay. would happily work on it if we can actually load the image. Mm-hmm. So the question would be, how can we go in load that image and then we'd have to use basically a different library than OpenSlide, which is fine. And in fact, we've done some other work. I mentioned DICOM. I, I took me maybe two hours to make a DICOM version. Um, of course, that requires more, more, I would say, Python experience, but it's really not as complex as it sounds because we only load the image in one specific place. So if you mm-hmm. just go and change those four or five lines of code to use a different image reading library, then the rest of that pipeline will, will remain the same. So it's not like you have to mm-hmm. dig around and make a lot of changes. It's really very localized in one specific place. So that brings me to my and um, Mark's next question. Yep. So um, uh, there is considerable heter- heterogeneity in the types of artifacts. Uh, does this um, tool perform better on one versus the other? And my add-on uh, to this question, based on what we just discussed, would then IF require totally different parameters for artifacts, new definition, like addition of the features, right? So what's interesting here is that HistoQC doesn't really have models. It's, it's HistoQC is more of a statistical comparison. So HistoQC mm-hmm. will say this slide is not stained well because it is different than the other slides. So it's not going to make a judgment for you and say this is a good slide, this is a bad slide. What HistoQC is really doing is using first order statistics to identify outliers. Its goal is to look for weird stuff and it helps you visualize that that weird stuff. So 
I don't, I don't really think like, for example, when we moved from H and E to uh, IHC, we didn't change any code. We added some additional features, right? Because some of the metrics weren't as useful or, or there's different things that you want to measure on an IHC versus an H and E that are really interesting for quality control, such as like background staining and, and this sort of stuff. So we added additional features, but everything else worked exactly as it was because you're comparing now IHC values to other IHC values, mm -hmm. right? You wouldn't go and compare an H and E set of metrics yeah. to an IHC metrics. And then as a result of that, you, you really kind of like break it down on a piece by piece basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more question and we move on with the presentation. Can you transfer the masks from HistoQC to another software? Like I see it as, let's say, like HistoQC provides masks and then I want an image analysis software run on everything mm -hmm. else than this mask. Can I do that? Yes, absolutely. And we have a slide that discusses that. Those are, Beautiful. yeah, you know, I think we'll probably get to it on like the next slide. So let's, let's leave it for that. Okay. Um, so we define a pipeline for each of those pipelines. As I mentioned before, you can define parameters. So you can define like, I want to remove small objects. Well, you tell me how small an object is to you, right? Maybe you need every single cell on your slide, or maybe you say, I'm only interested in things that are at least 50 cells big. And then you do a quick area estimation and you kind of type them in there. Um, we're going to show this, this template example on the, the next slide. And then you uh, execute the pipeline. Really, executing the pipeline is, is as simple as this, right? You type, I want to run HistoQC, dash C V 2.1. That's the name of the configuration file. As I mentioned, we provide five or six different ones. You can just type in its name here. Dash N3 means to run three whole site images in parallel. So if you have a high performance computing server that has 32 cores, you can run 32 slides in parallel. That's fine. And then you point it at the directory where the files are located. The output here is now going to be a tab separated file. Um, so it can be read into Python, MATLAB, Excel, R. I mean, it's the most basic generic format that, that you can possibly imagine. And then all of the thumbnails themselves are stored as PNGs. So you can load that PNG in absolutely any image program that you can imagine, and it'll very happily be paint. So you can load that into QPath. You, you can, can load, load it into, into Paint. You can load it into Microsoft Paint. Exactly. That, right. You can load anything. Anything's going to load that. And again, this was intentional because we wanted it to be as, as versatile as possible. And we made some design decisions to, to support that. So the template feature matching, I think, is one that's very interesting because I, it'll hopefully connect with some of the points that we'll discuss later. But the idea is that we have a template and I can compute a distribution. Just hold on. This is not going to be nearly as bad as you think it is. The point is, this is the distribution of the blue, green, and red inside of this image. That's all you have to know. Just look at the curves, blue, green, red. Great. Here's another image. Hopefully, you see template one is different than template two. Unsurprisingly, yeah, nice <laughs> the distribution is also different, right? That's it. That's all, that's, that's all you have to know in order for this to work. So template one and template two are things that you can provide to HistoQC and say, this is my template one, this is my template two, my template three, template four, or only one template, or 50 templates, up to you. Now, HistoQC will take a whole slide image. It'll generate a similar distribution. It'll do it for this, this other one here. And we start to maybe see where I'm going here. These two look very similar. These two look very similar. These two look very dissimilar. All HistoQC does is it will go and do a comparison between those distributions. And you see when the distributions look very similar, the distance is very small. And when, if I compare this one to this one over here, to template two, it's two orders of magnitude larger. Similar with this other side. When the distributions look similar, the error is small. And when the distributions are quite different, the error is much larger. So this naturally fits into this idea of, is my slide within tolerances? You can say, I want all of my slides to look like this. And as a result of that, when you compare, I'm willing to accept a difference of 0 0.001. Anything more than that, it's too much for me. I want you to identify that for me. Right, so now you can start to set your own definitions of what you think is is good or bad. Exactly, yeah. and I bet you're going to be talking about this when we're going to be talking about cohorts and all these stuff. But I want to start the uh, the thought and the discussion. So um, there is like a big push in the deep learning uh, tissue image analysis community for generalizability of all algorithms, and they have to be generalizable across the world. Question one: Is that even feasible there's always going to be like extremes and your model is going to be working 
somewhere within the spectrum of those extremes? And can you then use HistoQC to decide, oh, is my model going to be okay for this slide or not? <laughs> and then the next... <laughs> <laughs> I did not so... learn it by heart. So that was it. Did you study this beforehand? Uh, this, no. this is I mean, I looked at it, but these are no, these are great points. These are great, great organic points that, that should be brought up. You want to go and say, I built an algorithm, right? Now I've built an algorithm. I want to ask two things. One is, will my algorithm work on this new slide I'm about to get? And if your algorithm is only built with template one type images and you get a template two type image, is it going to work? I don't know the answer to that. It's less likely to work, I would argue. Is it definitely going to work or is it definitely not going to work? I have no idea. But maybe you want to be made aware of that, that fact. Then the second part is and say, well, I've actually tested it with this image. HistoQC is going to provide you that information and say, oh, I've tested it with images in this range, this range, and this range. So now when you go and have another similar image, you can look at where it fits in that and say, oh, this is within a range that I've, I've tested it on. 20 slides that have similar properties. It did work very well. Now you have greater confidence that it is going to work uh, on this new image. Or, oh, this is completely different than the 50 images we've trained it with. It's different than the 2,000 images we validated it with. Maybe we shouldn't trust the output from here. Maybe we should flag it. Maybe we should remove it, right? So then you, you start to get these really nice questions to ask about a particular slide without really having to do a lot of additional work just by going and keeping track of all the information that's going into the algorithms and going into the systems. And it's a tab separated file. You can easily store it. It's like a few kilobytes. It's worth it. If you can store a thousand whole slide images, you can you can store a tab separated file. You can store file. this file. So I'm gonna just quickly ask one more question that is uh, about the features uh, that you're um, sorting for or asking HistoQC to give you an output on. Given that this is a statistical model, could you use HistoQC to measure, say, the straightness or tortuosity of a core biopsy? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great question. So the idea is that currently no, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I think the, the grammar of that question suggests that HistoQC has a statistical model. HistoQC has many, 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 many features, right? So we you would have to have a, a kind of a tortuous feature for that Added to then be a, the an anomaly. That said, building that torturous feature detector, I'm pretty confident there exist open source approaches right now that will do that in four or five lines of code. You would just add the boilerplate HistoQC stuff above and below, and then you'd organically go and compute it and store that. So I think that's an example of something that we can, you know, provide support to develop that I don't think is too sophisticated and was, was very well within the, the realm of reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the user interface uh, that we discussed. So you have the very nice um, kind of table on top. This kind of functions like an Excel table. So you can sort the columns, you can drag the columns, you can resize the columns. And these are the features that have been computed. You see, it's really not that sexy. No one wants to go and look at like these 80, 80 digit numbers or whatever it is. This is really, I think the major value here, right? So this is a parallel coordinate plot. Each line is a slide and each Y axis is a value or a feature that has been computed. So now you start to see it's not a feature that we're computing. We're computing many, many, many different features. And we can now see uh, there's about 500, sorry, there's about 94 slides visible here. So now you're not looking at one slide at a time. You're looking at 100 slides at the same time. And you're starting to see how those slides are starting to interact. And then the bottom part, you see the original image. And then next to it, you see a fuchsia overlay of where HistoQC has decided there's good quality slide for a downstream computation. You see we've like ignored some of the holes in the tissue. Um, for my research, we really don't look at adipose tissue. So I built an adipose tissue detector and remover, like these sort of things. And if, if adipose is important for you, you just disable it, right? Mm -hmm. But what's, what's interesting here is you see, this is that microns per pixel that I mentioned before. So instead of having to look at an Excel spreadsheet of a thousand images or 10,000 images and say, is there heterogeneity in my microns per pixel? You can now look at this and I can say, oh yeah, not only that, I can see that there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven batches of different microns per pixel, right? And now I can say, oh, there's probably seven batch effects that I should be aware of at least, right? So this is going to help me start thinking about experimental designs. Where did these come from? Why are these kind of grouped together? As well, I can start to go and see, oh, wrong way. As well, I can start to see outliers, right? So this is a pen marking artifact. One of the slides has a pen mark. We'll, we'll go deeper into that example on the next line. But you start to get this impression when you look across 
this this parallel coordinate plot that there's weird stuff. Like for example, this this one slide here has a very, very low contrast. So just by looking at this, if you had a thousand slides and you had five minutes to invest in quality control, you'd say, I want to look at this one. Or like, why is this one so far away from all of the other 999? What is this one? Why is this one different than this one? What is this one over here? Right. So now you start to think about how what a reasonable slide looks like or reasonable level of variance of these are and things outside of that are the ones that you start to say, maybe I should check this and see what's going on. We have an example of the animated GIF where you can go and the parallel coordinate plots are interactive. So as you draw a filter on them, it'll show you which slides are going through that filter. And then when you let go of the mouse, it'll update the images on the bottom. Now, when you go to the bottom here, those were those two weird images. You look at them, and there's no contrast. So it turns out one of those images uh, didn't have the uh, chemotoxylin stained at all on it. It was only ASIN, and as a result, there was no contrast in the tissue. So we managed to find a very poor quality slide just by going and looking at one of the outbreaks. Mm -hmm. Yes, question. Question from me, and then we have from uh, our guest. From me, uh, is it where is it? Um used is it uh, already applied where you're working is it something you guys are so using? that's something that's in, in process of what we're what we're trying to do mm -hmm. where do you envision this if you don't have a slide on this if you have uh, i of course will wait but where do you envision who is going to be doing this like which who from the personnel is going to be looking at those graphs and choosing where to put the effort for quality control so in the clinical diagnostic systems that I know of, there's already a person mm -hmm. that's doing quality control, right? There's so already a them. person. This is a it's tool them. for them. It's them, but mm -hmm. now okay. they're going to be a hundred times more efficient, mm -hmm. right? And they're going to okay. go and they're not going to have to look at every single slide laboriously or randomly select slides and hope that they get a good one. Instead, they're going to say, here's the list of the next 10 slides that you should look at. And then um, that's going to, you know, we, we show that that's a, probably a pretty good way to do this. See, that's an answer. That is an answer to a question I always have. Like, how to minimize this effort? Like, I don't need to look at everything. Do I randomly choose what I look at? But this tool is basically showing me if, what to if look at. If you have at. no choice, then you have to. If you have no information, you have to do it randomly. But if you do have mm -hmm. some information, like quality then, control metrics that are, by the way, deterministic, right? So if you run that same slide 10 times, it's going to give you the same exact graph every single time. And I think that's really, really important because now there's no variability, right? So you can't say, oh, is this, if I go and ask you, uh, if I show you a slide and say, is this within one standard deviation of what you're normally used to seeing? Like, if you want, we can I run this I don't think experiment. I will be able to answer this question. I think you're going to give me different answers for the same slide if I space it out over three months, right? Because you're going to be influenced by the slides that you just saw that day. So if I waited till the end of the day, you'll say, oh, but I don't remember the ones from three months ago, whatever it is. Now we don't have to do that. I'll say oh, it's 0.374. It's still 0.374. If you want to change the cohort, we can give you an updated estimate of how dissimilar or similar it is to that. Mm -hmm. So one question from our guest. Has HistoQC ever been used to evaluate or compare virtual H&E images to normal or in between? Can you speak We've about- We've not done any uh, synthetic H&E staining. No, we haven't. I think we probably could. Could be interesting. Um, did, did my internet just die here? Comment if you're hearing us and seeing us again. We had a little bit. So of you power froze on outage. my side. I don't know if my. I had. A... Yeah, see, you're gone again. You know, I've never uh, been in this situation before. Uh, can someone write in the chat box if they can hear me? Can you hear responses to our answer, to, to our question? Yeah, OK. We have. Yeah. So uh, Trevor can hear me. I don't think he can hear you. Yes, yes. OK. Who do you hear, Trevor? Me or Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> if you if you have any um, outages on your end, let us know in the chat because then we will just wait till we hear from you. Um, okay, so they say I'm freezing, but Andrew is clear. Good, you're the you know guest that? of honor, and you're the one speaking about the tool, so that's all good. <laughs> okay, that's, I, I was a little nervous there, a little nervous there. Okay, 
let's continue. So we can also visualize individual results, right? I mentioned that there was one with pen marking. I can now go and do that filtering process, put it over the pen marking and you know, voila, I pull it up and I can now see that slide in a higher magnification. And I can see all of the individual outputs from HistoQC. So all of these are PNG images that are available in a directory. And you can see the binary masks. So here's the pen detection mask and it shows you where it detected the pen, pretty nice. It also goes and shows you inside of that cohort where the where this particular slide is in comparison, right? So it now puts it in red so you can kind of get a feeling for it. What's interesting is you can click on any of those. It'll bring up a higher magnification view and then you can kind of mouse over it and it'll show you this. And all of this is stored in the output directory. So you don't need access to the whole slide image after you go and produce this. And I think each slide is maybe five or 10 megabytes of storage for all of the output files. So it's very reasonable if the original input image is two gigabytes. It's a, I think a pretty, pretty, pretty okay trade off there. So question that's come up a few times now is what do you do with these outliers, right? You can make a decision. You can, if it's a really bad quality, then remove it entirely. Say this is, you know, have a huge air bubble. Not a single piece of this is in focus. Send it back if you're in the clinic or remove it if you're a scientist. Um, maybe some of the image is okay, but other parts of it are bad. So what you can do is use the HistoQC. We have a, a, a file called underscore mask use. This mask is where it identify there to be good tissue. And this mask is at the same aspect ratio as the original image. So if you're a computer person, you can load this image and figure out the aspect ratio and say, oh, this XY coordinate is exactly 12 times away from the other one and use that to decide where to go and crop regions of interest or, or things like that. Can you use those regions to train a deep learning classifier to detect artifacts? For sure. Yeah. I mean, you, you can. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. I so, so I would many, say the only, the only reason how why... many hours I spent annotating manually artifacts. So the reason why we haven't done that and, and probably won't do that within HistoQC is two reasons. One is that that classifier is going to take a lot longer to train and execute, right? So we're not looking at five seconds of to generate output. Now you have to, you know, get a GPU, right? There's a lot of additional infrastructure cost and, and time cost. The second part, and, and really the challenge is, is that you can build one for your data, but the one that you build for your data is not really going to work for a different site. And the challenge of building HistoQC is we really want it to be as generalizable as possible for all people to use. So as a result of us not going and working, let's say, to a specific site, we can go and use the same pipeline for PAS as H&E. We have to change nothing. And, mm -hmm. and that's really that value there. Well, if you build a deep learning model, it's going to be specific to that organ, specific to that uh, stain type, specific to that scanner, specific to the, you know, thickness of the microtome that cut the tissue. And now you're on the hook for genera, uh, generating and maintaining all of these models over time. Mm -hmm. It really becomes a little... But you can thing. totally use the output of this and then train your model if you wish. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the question is... Uh, the, the, okay, so we kind of touched on this. Does HistoQC give an estimation or guarantee that AI system will or will not perform? Oh, I mean, no, right? It there depends is no on, guarantee. It depends on the AI system, right? Like, <laughs> like we're not we're not an AI system developer. So if you have a more robust system, it's more likely to work. If you have a less robust system, it's less likely to work. You, you have to actually test your system with those those specific things. I think mm -hmm. the interesting thing is HistoQC can help you do that. So if you have a system, you can go and try for different images that you have and say, oh, it doesn't work well on these images. It works well on these images. What are the properties of these images? Oh, they're all stained a little bit more heavily with hemotoxylin or, oh, it's a little bit brighter. The contrast is a little bit higher. And then you can make your specification aim in that direction. So you can, HistoQC can't provide guarantees for anyone's downstream algorithms, but HistoQC but can the provide metric. you the metrics so that you can then go and figure out what is good or bad for that you. Within your, this cases. range yeah. of metrics, it's most likely to work. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we looked at uh, the usage of HistoQC in this Neptune consortium, right? We had 330 slides. We gave a very detailed written protocol to the three readers, ex experts in digital pathology, right? Three readers. And we basically asked a single simple question. Is this slide good enough quality to computationally analyze, right? 
and we looked at the concordance between them and we see that there's actually very low agreement, right? Statistically, you say this is pretty high agreement, but when you really think about what this means, you this means that your primary- 30 out of 100 is game, not agreed upon. It's gone, right? So now what are you doing here, right? Before even that experiment begins, you have different input, right? This immediately means everything else that's downstream from that is now going to be irreproducible, right? If you don't have reproducible quality control, you for sure can have reproducible experiments. So then we asked them to do the same process and this time use HistoQC, and we see that it went up, the concordance went up an absolute 23%. And it made it easier for them to do that. The reports from the users were, this was faster to use, this was easier to use, I didn't have to struggle, because now they weren't wondering, they weren't trying to remember what their previous 10 slides looked like. Now they say, oh, these are all 330 slides at the same time. Oh, this one's an outlier, this one's an outlier, this one's an outlier, this one's an outlier. This one might be, I have to check it. Oh yeah, this one's fine, that one's fine, boom, boom, boom. And they spend a fraction of the time and they get better, more concordant results without any additional overhead right? A, a human overhead. It's, I, I think this is like a fascinating study. I hope others feel the same. I do feel the same about this kind of studies because it's not just for what you just showed, uh, you know, you give a uh, details instructions to experts and they still disagree whether it's pdl1 scoring estimation of how many lymphocytes are there esti yep. estimation of anything wherever you have a human visually making a decision you're going to have subjectivity and the more you can take it out of those experiments that will have human input like in the whole pre-analytical part of the experiment and um, the more objective it can be and if we can make it if we can make it more objective, then I think it's better. And, and keep in mind, I'm not I'm not blaming the readers, right? I think this is no. a very hard thing to do. There's also biological. I don't variability think it's a needs. possible thing to do visually. I don't oh, think I this is this is like in all those scorings, and I am my blown by by the estimation of quanti uh, how much positivity there is on the slides and making mm -hmm. cutoffs based on visual so cutoff at 10 percent where the uh, difference between readers is over 30 percent is like good luck with your clinical trial and then keep in mind as well that humans you and i don't have the same amount of rods and cones in our eyes either so it's not even that you and I perceive color definitely the same way, right? We can we very likely don't see the same color when we look at the same color, right? So now you start to think about what that means in a nonlinear sense when you start to try and guess if your slide is an outlier or not. I mean, you're, it's, it's crazy. Like how, how could people agree? So the answer, is, the answer is tools. The answer has to be tools. And we also found something very interesting that I, I bring up. Um, we basically took this as an IHC image. We enhanced a, a local contrast of the grayscale image, and this was the end result. And we wrote a blog post about it. Uh, I have a blog at andrewjanowick.com. You can read about that stuff there. But now we keep in mind that this information here is in the image on the left, right? So we've not synthetically made this image. We've just taken the noise that already exists in this image that is very hard to see, and we've just amplified it so that you as a human can see it. But at the same time, for sure, a deep learning algorithm or a machine learning algorithm can see these differences because they're, would they're, be they're thrown differences. off by those differences. Exactly. So HistoQC now provides one of these uh, images as an output. So you can go and look at how, you know, kind of clean your slides are or what types of artifacts might be hidden in your slides that you're unaware of. Here you can see the tiling artifacts from when the scanner goes vertically or scans in strips. And that's the result of that sort of thing. You could kind of see the little pieces of dust. Uh, that are on the slide, right? So you see a lot of things that you wouldn't normally see. I think it's just pretty cool to look at, you know, and you can certainly see that some sites are able to put out better quality slides than, than others. You can also start to see the age of slides um, by certain different patterns that appear there. I think it's a, a fascinating uh, discovery that we made completely by accident. Lastly, for HistoQC, we've taken this tool and also expanded it into the imaging space. So we do PET, CT, MRI, same concepts, right? They're obviously different features. We're not measuring hemotoxylin intensity in a MRI image, but you know we can measure the intensity of the magnetic coil at the particular pixel, voxel locations, and you get the same multi-parallel uh, coordinate plot here. You get the same interactive bar charts and, and these sort of things. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, that's also free, publicly available, um, and 
maintained by us. Next tool, I think this one's a bit shorter. Yes, let's talk. So before we go yeah. to the next tool, a couple yeah. of questions, quick questions sure. from the audience. So yeah. first question is, do you know of a similar tool for the iSyntax file format? I don't. iSyntax okay. is- Okay, quick, quick answer to the yeah, question. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I know very few tools that actually work with iSyntax. It's so heavily uh -huh. proprietary. Well, Philips put out an SDK for it. Um, it's like 650 megabytes to download the, the software development kit. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So they basically, it's just like a wrapper where they say, hey, if you want to read this slide, you know, use this huge library and, and these kind of things to do it. Haven't had the uh, time to, to do it. To investigate it. And our quick question, will it work with a Motic scanner? I don't know what the output format of a Motic scanner is. Uh, but My intuition if, says well, probably <laughs> Probably not. Golam, if you can let us know what uh, format that is, then we might answer the question. And my question is, because I, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, and you may convince me otherwise, I don't code, I don't know how to code, and I don't know if like there's mm -hmm. any, bit for, any benefit for me to learning anything about coding to advance digital pathology. But what I sure. tend to do, and I want to ask you about this, if this is even a legitimate thing to do, I tend to promote very much the open source uh, tools that are available. I dislike mm -hmm. reinventing the wheel in the industry. Mm -hmm. And sure. then I go, I see those, they're open source. And I'm like, you guys can code. You, meaning all the people who are uh, working on software, be it open mm -hmm. source, be it uh, proprietary, be it uh, for uh, commercial software, like mm -hmm. they some part of this code, plug it into your thing, and just like don't start it from scratch. Mm -hmm. Is this viable way of advertising open source? Is it viable a uh, way of advertising histo QC? Could this be something incorporated into other people' uh, software? Yeah. Wow. A lot, a lot of questions there. So I think it's a you know I, I have to first give like the foolish answer or like kind of the naive uh, answer and say. You know, it depends on the tool, it depends on the code, and it depends on the thing, right? So if you, you, I'm sure you know that there are different programming languages, even if you don't know how to program. And you, it's know. not trivial to take like a, a C++ program and stick it into a Python program or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So even from the onset, there has to be some compatibility between, you know, a bare minimum. What about the concepts? So, but yeah, but the concepts are fine, right? So the concepts are interesting because I think most programmers should be able to read code of, of most languages, right? Um, read the code, maybe not program in it, but I've, it's been a very long time since I've seen any code written in any language that I couldn't get the general idea of with using a help guide. Like, oh, what does that function do? Let me look at, oh yeah, and then we're gonna save this and oh, read that from the, this. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, I, I see how this works, right? So then once you understand that concept, can you translate it into another language? Yeah, for sure. Is it faster than trying to build your own stuff? Also, yes, for sure. Yes, um, right? Yeah, but it, it's way easier, way easier than building your own stuff. Like anytime you have something that already works, it's super useful, super useful. You know, this is kind of like the idea of making counterfeits of anything. Like once you know something that works, counterfeiting it is basically pretty trivial. The thing with open source, it's not counterfeiting, it's encouraged it's and it's there hard. for you to yes, use. Right? Okay, so so good. QC, I'm going to keep clear, pushing for it. HistoQC has the most permissive software license that we can find. You can do absolutely anything you want with any component of Histo QC, and you will not receive a complaint from from anyone. It's basically and you in can the public charge space. for it. You can, you can. If someone's super interested on the call, there's absolutely nothing preventing you from throwing your logo on top of it and, and charging for it. That's how permissive this license is. But then I assume right. that you're going to have customers that that are going to yeah, go and want to provide. We'll support. need support, but right. then it's on you to provide support, right? It's already. Or don't and it's your customers. Stuff. I mean, like it's for you to figure out how you how you want to do that sort of stuff. But that's you know, I, I don't think that's that's part of like my responsibility inside of that context. I think our mm -hmm. our responsibility as as academics and as scientists is no. You you made the tool that them. does a yeah. certain thing, yeah. but yeah. I just wanted to uh, ask. Is it legitimate for me to point people to this? Because I see be tools, be, I be, read about those hard. tools, and I want to show people those tools because sure. obviously not everybody knows about those tools. Sure. Okay, so let's I mean, go it, back. It, you know, it could be mm -hmm. easier, it could be hard, but it's not. It's it it's it's sufficiently interesting and sufficiently right that I would suggest to you know keep keep pushing that drive, right? Because at the same time, code 
the code that we write also has to be, you can either write bad code or you can write good code. Of course, it's easier to reuse good code. It's easier to reuse code that's well documented. So there's a lot of kind of additional things that you can do if you know that other people are going to use your code that makes it easier and more transplantable um, to really kind of leverage the, the the time investment that you've put into building it in, in the first place. So okay. it's not perfect, but it's it's probably the best we got. That's good enough. That's better than reinventing the wheel. Yeah, but, yeah, but for sure. Like never reinvent the wheel because at least oh, right? you should find like a working version of it and then it, it's easier to transition between them. Cohort finder. Let's talk about Cohort this. Cohort finder. So we discovered, um, well, first let's start with the definition here. So batch effects are systematic technical differences in data unrelated to biological variation. It's very difficult for me to explain that you know, in a single sentence, so I have to read that. So th there it is. But we can now dive into this, right? So what are batch effects? It's essentially differences in things that shouldn't be different. So for example, here, these are uh, whole site images from the cancer genome atlas. These are colon cancer cases. These are I all colon tissue. They're all stained with H and E. Why does this one look blue and this one look very light and this one look kind of pink and this one look more dark and more purple, right? These are because of batch effects. They were built at different sites. They were stained with slightly different differences, but this isn't related to the disease itself. It's not related to the tissue itself. It's related to how that data was fundamentally generated from the onset. And these batch effects are related to domain shift with which probably the machine and deep learning folks uh, here un understand. And it results just in, in worse performance. It could be, it's not just H and E. These are examples of some of those kidney images. And you see variability here. In fact, if the same person made the same um, you know, slide across themselves, there would be much, much less variability, potentially even no variability. So you see this variance in uh, intensity, thickness, brightness, contrast, saturation, white balance. There's tons of different things that, that can affect this. The interesting point here is that this, <laughs> I think we just lost this over. The interesting thing here is that these things at the bottom kind of look like the same sort of stuff that HistoQC measures. And that's really what we, we want. So that we have a challenge then to try and partition this data. When we're building machine learning classifiers, we want to identify training sets and we want to identify validation and, and testing sets. We're going to use these training sets to adjust the network parameters and the validation to kind of evaluate the, the network performance uh, as a result of that, that training. So the end conclusion of all of this is that, hey, welcome back. The batch effects can welcome negatively- Welcome back to <laughs> my webinar. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> take, take a seat in the back. Take a seat in the back. Uh, batch effects can negatively impact machine learning models generalizability. Okay. So how do we typically go in and separate these? We, we, everyone uses random selection, right? So you have 100 images. You say, I'm going to put 80% of them for training, and I'm going to put 20% of them for validation. Uh, and you just separate them out. But you start to see that you're not really guaranteed to get a good separable set here right? You could potentially have a suboptimal separation. I'll discuss what that means in a second. What Cohort Finder does, and I'll, I'll use Cohort Finder, what it does as a, as a, I think, a solid example of that. Cohort Finder will intelligently partition this. So the first thing it does is it identifies these batch effect groups. So we see these are all kind of pink, these are all kind of blue, these are all kind of purple. It's identifying these automatically using the HistoQC metrics. Then it goes through and iteratively separates them. So now your training set is maximally diverse and your validation set is maximally diverse. So you're exposing a machine learning classifier to the stuff that it should learn. And then you're validating later on that it did learn the stuff as expected. And we show through our study that this helps mitigate the batch effects. So the properties of this is it really leverages the open source quality control tools we just mentioned, unsurprisingly. So the input to cohort finder is the output from HistoQC because we want those metrics to be able to identify similar slides in those batch effects. It's very, very, very fast to run. So HistoQC actually has to go and look at the images to compute the features. Cohort finder is just trying to solve a numerical problem based off of the very, very, very small subspace of the features that you've, you've previously computed. If you add more features to HistoQC, cohort finder is happy to use them. If you remove some of the, the features from HistoQC, Cohort Finder is happy to ignore them, right? So there's some flexibility there as well. And we show that it's useful across multiple domains, um, pathology and, and radiology. 
We also provide uh, statistical analyses. These are t-tests for variable confounding. So if you know specific sites that things have come from, we'll automatically run those statistical tests for you. If you were interested in, let's say, predicting outcome, we'll run statistical tests to see if there is a batch effect that's associated with the outcome of interest. And if there is, you should probably heavily redesign your experiment to take that into account, or at least be very cognizant of it to make sure that you were using proper techniques to try and mitigate for them. It is also free and publicly available at cohortfinder.com. So how does this work? We take these uh, HistoQC high dimensional data, we embed it into two dimensions using a tool called UMAP. So you can think of this as a hundred dimensional space. It puts all of the slides in a two dimensional space and you can kind of see there's groups forming, right? Now what's interesting is that if we cluster those groups, we start to see that each of those clusters looks pretty similar. So these are where all of the dark slides are. These are all the light slides are. These are all the blue slides are. And then Cohort Finder can sequentially go from each of those small clusters and randomly divide them into training and into validation. We provide visual feedback. So we have thumbnails. We have a high level summary thumbnail that says, this is what I think the batch effect group look one looks like. And it gives you an example. This is what two looks like. So if you have 20 detected batch effects, you can see all examples from all 20 in a single image. It's very fast and efficient in that way. As well, you probably want to see what the group actually looks like. So there's a separate set of images. Uh, these are called, called contact sheets, where it's basically one single image that has many smaller images inside of it. And you can see this is genuine, true results from um, the from Cohort Finder. You can see Cohort Finder successfully identifying batch effect group one. It successfully identified batch effect group two. It successfully identified batch effect group three, right? These are kind of blue, red, and, and purple. All unsupervised, all automatic. So we performed the renal segmentation task here, where again, we use this Neptune consortium. There's 118 patients from 25 sites, and we used 25 patients from different sizes held out, held out data. And we did this random sampling where we just kind of took the data in a very unbiased way and just randomly divided it. We also did the worst case. And you asked previously, what happens if you don't use these types of tools? Yes. So in this worst case, we've taken, we've tried to maximize the difference between the training set and the validation set using histoqc metrics so in this case these are again real world real world experiment that we you know didn't do any tampering we see all of these are you know pink and kind of purplish and all of these are red right so this is the worst case and it was computationally defined and optimized so it's not like we cherry picked it and then we have the cohort finder version where we go and we found the batch effects and then we optimally split them and we did threefold cross validation to really kind of remove any type of measurement error from our, our stuff is what the result looked like. And it's basically, unsurprisingly, hopefully I've convinced you that batch effects exist. And if you can detect them successfully, you can probably- You did convince better. me in 2019 already that they exist with your <laughs> pen mark example. <laughs> there it is. Thank you. Wow. That's great. That's that's That makes me very happy. Thank you. We can see that these batch effect results, first of all, the average or the mean performance is higher than the uh, worst case in the average case, but as well, the variance is lower than the other ones. So, so we see in the worst case, let's say you know nothing about batch effects. Keep in mind when you randomly sample, one possible result that you can have is the worst case. This is the worst right? case. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind the worst case is not binary. You'd say, well, what's the likelihood that I end up in the worst case? You know, probably pretty small, but what's the likelihood you end up in the worst case minus one slide? more minus two slides or minus three. And then you start to realize that the worst case, average case and best case exists on a spectrum. continuous spectrum. Mm -hmm. And when you randomly sample, you have no idea in that spectrum where you are. So you're gonna go and spend all this time to train classifiers and you may be close to that worst case and not even realize it. Here we can go and I think we've quantitatively shown that you can use cohort finder and always guarantee you end up in the best case in 15 seconds of computation time question yes can you use it like post model development to define the the, the cohort where the model performs best on yeah for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. okay good yeah i'm going to touch touch a little bit more in deep uh in depth on the the next slide or the the, the, the slide after that but yeah. okay and then we have the qualitative results and this is what those results look like Right. So here's your ground truth in, you know, binary masks. We have an overlay 
these are the best case, worst case, average case. And this is a difference image where the green are false negatives and the purple are false positives. But visually, I think it's pretty clear that the worst case performs really badly, right? And again, you exist somewhere on a spectrum between these results and these results, and you don't know where you are. And just by going and providing better data partitioning, which again is going to take you 15 seconds if you use Cohort Finder, you'll be able to go and improve. In this case, it looked like we improved about 40% in absolute terms. Same model training, same augmentation, same everything. The only thing we changed was how that data was partitioned. We've integrated this into uh, HistoQC. So we can now see in HistoQC the embedding plots. You can start to see if there's uh, potentially some batch effects inside of your data. As well, you can load Cohort Finder also produces a tab separated value file. Uh, and you can load that into HistoQC and it'll make very nice where the groups are, where it thinks the groups are, and if an image should be in the training or validation set based off of that random sample. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, right, this uh, is a, a quantitative data partitioning strategy. We hope it's going to reduce batch effects. Um, I think this is really interesting, and this is what I wanted to touch on before. It can help you identify which images to prioritize for diversity. So let's say you work with a collaborator and you're a pathologist and they say, hey, we have 10,000 images we want you to annotate or review. And you say, well, I don't really don't want to do 10,000. Um, you say, can you build me a model? They'll say, yeah, we'll build you a model, but we don't really know how to you know, give a, a broad general sense of diversity to build that training data. And I showed you before that if you're unlucky, you might have 50% accuracy. If you're really lucky, you can have 93% accuracy all based off of sheer luck, unless you use a quantitative approach. So now you can go and use Cohort Finder. It'll find you all of the different diverse batch groups. And the solution to optimizing your time is to pick just one from each of those groups and say, these are the ones that you should start by annotating. And you say, well, I'm only interested in doing five of them. Pick the ones that are most separated from each other on the plot. And now you have the most diverse examples that when you build a model with those are much more likely to generalize across a larger space um, for in that, that deep learning solution space. Yes. High five question. So do you see this first part of the question? Do you see it in other applications of uh, machine learning slash deep learning as being a requirement already or and will you and do you start seeing it as a requirement, uh, for example, by the paper reviewers? I then in the future think of this being a requirement by regulators. They will ask on which spectrum the model works. Are we in the infancy or is it already implemented somewhere else and we're just catching up? So I think that's a fascinating question. So I think for, for sure in digital pathology, we're in the infancy. At the same time, in, in the context of deep learning and digital pathology or deep learning in general, we, we know about these things, right? We, we know mm -hmm. about domain shift and this is really just a measurement of domain shift and how to kind of ameliorate domain shift by finding better examples to train on this sort of stuff. There's a lots of research that's trying to solve these through other techniques, right? So you can go say, well, we're gonna use a lot of augmentation when we train our deep learning classifiers and we're gonna use stain normalization when we go, right? So there's a lot of implicit ways that we've tried to deal with this, this issue. I would argue that most of them are pretty Always computationally get a expensive. different slide. Right, instead you can just pick a different slide. And as well, a lot of those techniques, I don't think are going to fully compensate for it. So if you have things like differences in tissue thickness, you can use stain normalization, but the amount of actual information that's available in that, that tissue, the thickness of it is gonna be fundamentally different. So that slide should gen genuinely be treated differently, even if it was stained the same, because it's thicker and the information content is different. Now, if you can identify that, which HistoQC appears to do a pretty reasonable job of, if you can identify that, now you can go and say, we're going to use this one for training. We're going to use this one for training. We're going to use this one for training. You already have a broader a broader spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it's in its infancy, but I, I think once you start to see the, the ability of doing this, like as well, um, how do people compensate for this in papers, for example? Well, now in, in most reviewers will go and say, you've only trained your model once here and shown me the output. Instead, I want you to use a threefold random cross-validation. And you, you know, I review a lot of papers. When you ask for this and you see the results, the authors start to understand why you asked for it. Because their 95% accuracy 
was not a mm-hmm. true exemplar of what they they showed. That was they happened to be closer to that best case. But as a result of that best case scenario, they've through random sampling because it's it's an uncontrolled process they get one that's 50% accurate. And then their final accuracy ends somewhere in the, the mid seventies. And they say, well, why did this really happen? They say, well, your data that was going in, was it well represented in the training and your testing sets? If you go and think about how to do this in a more optimal way, you would get, maybe you won't get that 95%. Maybe you'll get 90%, but you'll get a consistent 90% across mm-hmm. all of those different, different folds. Or you keep your 95 in a specific uh appearance of slides which is fine as well so i've seen approaches where you just do your lab as in lab developed tests you don't have any uh, ambitions to go more broader than that and you keep your lab within a certain frame and and that's where you have your 95. yeah okay so i I think uh cohortfinder.com i think what we've shown today so far is some of these to some of these tools to facilitate biomarker discovery, diagnostics, both the, in terms of research and in clinical. We've touched on the first one and the last one. We have two more sessions coming up to discuss quick annotator and patch sort. I hope you join us there. As I mentioned at the beginning, tons of collaborators. The team. Possible to, to thank them all, the, the team. So I thank, of course, the team for you know letting me take the spotlight and, and present uh, their work to the world. And uh, I thank everyone, if you want to contact me. Here are some email addresses, my blog for lots of digital pathology related stuff, tools, URLs. Uh, we're also perpetually hiring for both software Take engineer roles. Of this one. This is the one. The software engineer roles, PhD students, all that sort of stuff. So you can uh, reach out to me for that as well. See, not only free tools, you're also offering jobs. This is fantastic. No, that's nice. So that's a nice way to think about it. For everyone who is still here with us, uh, we have three sessions. Uh, we touched on the two tools that uh, Andrew mentioned. If you have any, um, like a direction where we you would want this session to go or particular applicational cases, we're going to leave a little bit more time in the last session for your questions and for discussions for those who want to implement it, who want to apply it. And... Uh, In the meantime, try already going there, checking if this would be useful for your workflow, and then you can come with questions that are really like, Andrew, why is it not working? Sounds good? I'll bring the team. Okay. (laughs) You'll bring the team on your (laughs) end. (laughs) (laughs) And I will collect comments. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for staying, and we see you next time. Bye. Thank you, everyone.